Welcome to Reader Meet Writer Southern Edition featuring Mary Kay Andrews with her new book, Hello Summer. We hope to provide some retail therapy, entertainment, and distraction during this hour. I'm Wanda with the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance, and now to today's writer. Mary Kay Andrews is the New York Times best-selling author of 24 novels, including The Weekenders, Beach Town, Ladies' Night, Summer Rental, Deep Dish, Hissy Fit, and Today's Hello Summer. A native of St. Petersburg, Florida, she received a BA in journalism from the University of Georgia and was a newspaper reporter for 14 years. The last 10, 10 years of her career were spent as a features reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. After a 14-year career working as a reporter at newspapers, including the Savannah Morning News, the Marietta Journal, and the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, where she spent the final 10 years of her career, she left journalism in 1991 to write fiction. Her first novel, Every Crooked Nanny, was published in 1992 by HarperCollins Publishers. She went on to write 10 critically acclaimed mysteries under her real name. In 2002, she assumed the pen name Mary Kay Andrews with the publication of Savannah Blues. In 2006, Hissy Fit became her first New York Times bestseller followed by 11 more New York Times, USA Today, and Publishers Weekly bestsellers. To date, her novels have been published in German, Italian, Polish, Slovenian, Hungarian, Dutch, Czech, Japanese, and thank goodness, English. <laughs> Mary Kay, how are you doing today? I'm good, Wanda. Great to be with all these wonderful people today. It's good to see people, isn't it? Yeah, it definitely is. It's great to see you. So will you tell us about Hello Summer and tell us about how you're doing? And I will. I will. Uh, Hello Summer, I have to update my bio because Hello Summer is my 27th or 28th novel. Oh, my God. 27th, I think. I did a, a cookbook a couple years ago. Hello Summer, um, which just came out, is my valentine to newspapers and print journalism. The protagonist's name is Conley Hawkins, and when the book opens, she's at her going away party in the newsroom at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, which not coincidentally was the last paper where I worked. And um, she's about to cut the cake, and that's part of the newsroom ritual. When you, your last day at work, you get a cake, and if they really like you, you get a luncheon. Um, and uh, she's about to cut the cake and make a quick exit, because she is not one for long goodbyes. She gets a text message from her older sister, Grayson. And Grayson, and she and Grayson have a very complicated, uh, not so friendly sibling uh, relationship. And, uh, Grayson is back home in, in Conley's hometown of Silver Bay, Florida, which is a tiny town on the Florida panhandle. And um, her sister is running the family-owned weekly newspaper, which is a struggling um, institution. It's called the Silver Bay Beacon. So Conley is at her going away party. She gets a text message from her sister with a link to a wire story saying that, and Conley's getting ready to go work for a big, uh, Washington news gathering, a digital only news gathering oper operation. And she gets a text from her sister with a link to a story that announces that the digital operation has ceased publication. So now Conley is in a world of hurt. She's quit her job. She's broken up with her boyfriend in the newsroom. And uh, she's been living with her boyfriend and given up her apartment. So now she's jobless, loveless, and homeless. She doesn't have a whole lot of options. So she very reluctantly goes home to Silver Bay and, does, and her plan is just to hang out at her grandmother's beach house. And her grandmother has a great big old um, beach house on the Gulf of Mexico called the Dunes. And um, it's the family gathering place. And you can see behind me, um, I'm actually at our house, old wooden house on the beach on Tybee Island, uh, Georgia. But Conley, um, 
her plan is just to hang out with her grandmother, work on her tan for a few days, send out some resumes, get a job, and get the hell out of Dodge, because she has no, absolutely no inclination to stay in this one light, one light town where nothing ever happens, as she says. Of course, as soon as she gets to um, Silver Bay, her grandmother starts uh, guilt tripping her, trying to get her to come to work for the paper, uh, the Silver Bay Beacon. And Conley has no intention of doing that. It, it's a struggling weekly. It's a huge step down from the big reporting career she had working for a big city daily. And she has relationships that issues with her sister. And um, she really has very big issues with coming back home again. And um, so that's the setup, a long setup for Hello Summer. Hello Summer is the name of the weekly society column that is written by um, the community icon, Rowena Meggs. And um, what Conley's grandmother wants her to do is ghostwrite that column because Rowena uh, isn't exactly um, the sharpest tack in the drawer. <laughs> and uh, Conley has no intention of doing that. But she, her grandmother, you know, Southern, uh, Southern ladies of a certain age wield a certain kind of power. And um, since I guess I'm close to that age, um, or that age, uh, we know how to do it. We can guilt trip you, we can tongue lash you, bribe you, blackmail you, whatever it takes. We, a, a Southern woman will, will wield her power. And her mother, her grandmother, she calls her G-Mama. G-Mama certainly manages to do that. So one of the first nights Conley is home, she's got cabin fever. This town, nothing happens in this town. They roll up the sidewalks at nine o'clock. And at nine o'clock at night, she decides she needs a cocktail. And the only late night places to drink in town were the bowling alley, but the bowling alley has closed down. So Conley gets in her car and drives out to the nearest juke joint, which happens to be the American Legion bar. <laughs> and uh, I don't know about you, but every Southern town I've been ever been in has a juke joint. And lots of times it's the, it's the American Legion bar. We've got one on Tybee Island and I think beers are a dollar and uh, wine is a dollar too. And you can also use it to um, remove your alcohol. You can also use the wine at the American Legion here to remove your nail polish or uh, clean the valves in your car. <laughs> so uh, she goes to the American Legion, she's sitting at the bar and she bumps into her oldest family friend. His name is Sean Kelly. And he literally was the boy next door. He, she grew up two doors down from his name, him. Um, as a kid, he was a tall, skinny bean pole. So, and Skelly, Sean Kelly became Skelly. So they're sitting at the bar, shooting the breeze, having some drinks. Uh, they danced to the jukebox, and um, Conley very, after a few drinks, she kind of admits that she used to have a crush on Skelly. Well, it gets to be three in the morning, and Skelly points out that she is in no shape to drive home, but he volunteers to drive her back to Silver Bay and to her grandmother's house. And so they get in the car, and they start driving back. This bar is about 30 miles from town. And they come across a one car accident. It's a um, Escalade and it is um, smoking. Smoke is pouring out of it. They try, they get out of the car and try to rescue the driver. They can see an unconscious older man in the car. Um, they can't get the door open. They call for the fire trucks. The fire trucks arrive and the car is in flames. And um, by the time they get the man out, he, he's deceased. But they're not sure. Conley doesn't know who it is. Um, and th the next day or so, they discover that the occupant of the flaming car, and it's a mystery because, you know, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's three in the morning. There's only, there's no car, other cars around. So nobody knows, you know, what happened. Then uh, next day, they, they discover that the driver of the car is the congressman, long-term congressman for that district. Long-term, uh, very conservative, very popular, conservative Republican congressman. And um, of course, there's a lot of mourning in town. He was a Vietnam War hero. He's done a lot over the years to bring jobs and money back home to the district. And, um, you know, there's, there's sadness in the land. 
And but Conley just can't figure out why this guy who's in his late seventies, eighties, what's he doing out in the middle of nowhere at three in the morning? And come to find out, the congressman uh, has had a terminal cancer diagnosis, which his family has not divulged, and he has not divulged. And um, and that makes her even more curious. If he was home getting chemo or having, if he'd been on chemo, what's he doing out in the middle of the night driving around? And she keeps asking questions. And once she gets a, her teeth into this story, she does not let go. And nobody wants her to ask any more un, unpopular questions. His family is certainly not friendly toward her. And her grandmother and her sister say, leave it alone. But Conley cannot, uh, she is not the kind of person that can stop once she gets started. So she pokes the bear. And it turns out that there is a political scandal um, in the offing. So um, she gets drawn deeper and deeper into investigating that scandal. And while doing that, uh, eventually puts herself in some danger, uh, gets herself mired in local politics and um, gets threatened, the paper gets threatened. And the paper is really struggling. And part of the reason I wanted to write this story is I have a deep and abiding love and faith in uh, American journalism, print journalism especially. And news print journalism is struggling these days. Papers are folding, they're cutting jobs. Um, and it's never been more important to me that we have good, credible journalism, especially print journalism. So, uh, and especially um, small town papers are um, very, very vulnerable. Um, newspapers don't make their money, a lot of people don't understand, people don't, uh, papers don't make their money from circulation. Circulation is a money loser. They make money from advertising. And uh, once you don't have, once you've lost advertising, um, for instance, classified advertising is, is almost disappeared because Craigslist, you know, you can advertise things for free these days. Why would you buy, pay for an ad? Um, so there are lots of pressures on print journalism these days. And um, Conley's family is, has, begot, has become way too familiar with all these struggles. But as Conley starts writing these stories, uh, interest in the town um, picks up. The circulation starts to take off. And of course, so do, so do the threats to shut this story down. And, um, you know, along the way, things heat up between Conley and um, Skelly. So that's a little bit of the story. And I will tell you that um, this is one of the, the plot for this story was one of those rip from the headlines um, ideas. Um, I was reading my hometown paper, the St. Pete Times. We got anybody, I hope we have somebody here tonight from St. Pete, from Tombola Books, um, or one of our great Florida bookstores, indie bookstores. I was reading my hometown paper and I read a story about five or six years ago about the long-term congressman there. Um, he was in his 80s and died and at his funeral, he was beloved, at his funeral his son got up to give the eulogy and mentioned that among the mourners besides himself and his siblings and his mother were um, his father's secret first family. Oh my God. I know! And of course, heads in the uh, church spun around and um, come to find out um, the congressman had been married for 35 years. And then along the way, um, his wife was back home in the district. He had four grown children and grandchildren. And he um, had an affair with a secretary in his congressional office. She had his child and uh, he went to his wife and asked for a divorce and uh, offered her a very nice settlement. But one of the contingencies of the settlement was that she should walk away and keep her mouth shut, which she did. And so even his official congressional biography did not mention his first family or his first marriage. And very few people back in the district knew about any of this until um, his, the day of his funeral. So um, I followed that story and I thought, oh, that, that is juicy. Someday I, must, I might be able to use that. So in Hello Summer, I needed Conley to have a big, uh, a big juicy story to sink her teeth into. And that is, that's, was the gift that reading newspapers gave me. 
That's so, very uh, cool. I said, that's very cool. Yeah, and you know, there are characters in the book that were inspired by characters that I work with in my newspaper career. For instance, Rowena Meggs, the gossip column, columnist was inspired by the longtime society columnist that I worked with uh, when I went to work at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And anybody who knows Atlanta maybe remember um, Yolanda Gwynn. And Yolanda was an institution. And uh, there were a lot of stories about her. Yolanda had been around for so long and she was still working there when I was when I was working in the features department at the Constitution in the 80s. She had covered the Atlanta premiere of Gone with the Wind. That's how long she had been in newspapers. And uh, she wasn't noted. She was she was beloved, but she wasn't noted for getting all the facts straight. Um, so I, I kind of used borrowed some of the stories that I had heard over the years about Yoland. Um, and they show up in the story. There's a, the, the Silver Bay Beacons uh, receptionist is, a, is kind of a feisty, prickly lady named Lillian King. And um, the receptionist that we had in the features department at the paper where I worked had that same name. And she was hilarious and she put everybody in their place. And so I don't usually use people's real names when I create fictional characters, but Lillian is no longer with us and can't defend herself. <laughs> Although she would love, love the fact that she was being named in a, in a novel. Um, and then when I worked uh, for the Savannah paper, where I started my newspaper career, it's funny, I'm talking to you now from Tybee Island outside of Savannah. And this is where, you know, it's sort of a circular thing. This is where I started my career as a little 22-year-old baby newspaper reporter. Um, there was a, a really colorful photographer who worked at the uh, Savannah paper and he was around for a long, long time. And he dressed always in black. He drove a white Corvette and the Corvette had a homemade licensed pre uh, prestige tag on the front. He'd made it himself and it said working press. And this photographer, um, he would get off work. I worked the 2 to 11 shift, uh, the graveyard shift. Um, and he would get off work at 11 and he would drive around all night looking for breaking stories to shoot. You know, car fires. He loved a car fire. Never met a car fire he didn't love. And um, he had, back in the day, um, you know, you had a radio in your, he had a radio in his car and he would call the city desk um, and say, I'm at a breaking, I'm, I'm at a breaking car, a car fire right now out on Abercorn Extension. And he had his own radio handle, which was Tri-X1, which is, was a kind of film that photographers used to use back in the day. And so you would be sitting at your desk working and you would hear Tri-X1 to base, Tri-X1 to base, big car fire. <laughs> so I never forgot this guy, uh, the man in black, and I fashioned a character in Hello Summer after him. Now my character is a uh, late night radio DJ who calls himself the man in black. And he has a secret past. So all of these kinds of stories kind of come into play. And um, I had a lot of fun writing it. It's, it's my Valentine to, to newspapers. That sounds wonderful. That sounds wonderful. I love it. So excited about that. Um, are you? Are you ready for some questions? I was going to ask you if you were ready for some questions. I'm ready if you are. I am always ready to answer questions. Okay, it's time for questions, y'all. Good. It's, it's important you stay muted so we can all hear. So I'm going to remind you in the chat option, start your question with a capital Q, name your local store if you'd like, and we'll give them a shout out when you ask your question. Linda Marie, do we have a question? Yes, we have lots of questions. Yes, um, for Mary Kay. One of the um, one of these is from a fan of Quail Ridge Books in Raleigh, North Carolina. Quail Ridge, and they ask, "Are you doing a lot of writing and cooking during the quarantine?" Cooking, yes. <laughs> I've probably gained fifteen pounds. I don't dare get near a scale. Um, I haven't been doing much writing. I've been too distracted. Um, I find that my, sh my attention span is much shorter. I think like a lot of us, I'm anxious and stressed and distracted. Um, so I stress bake. <laughs> I have, I am working on next summer's book very slowly. 
um, Kelly Justice of Fountain Bookstore in Richmond, Virginia. Hi, Kelly. She has a question um, for her book clubs and herself. What's your favorite dish to take to book club? And is it okay for me to make it and eat the whole thing myself? <laughs> and, then she, and then she asks also, maybe something from your Beach House cookbook. Yeah, well, of course, I, I insist that you make carbs. <laughs> I think carbs are my all seven, six food groups these days. Yeah, there are lots of yummy things. Um, I make, what do I make for my book club? I like the blonde brownies. Um, I put bourbon in them because there is nothing, almost nothing that bourbon doesn't help. Uh, the blonde brownies are good. If you insist on having something healthy, there's a... Um, a salad, a really nice salad that has uh, pink grapefruit sections and avocado, and it's actually kind of light and, and delicious. If you're feeling generous, there's, um, I think there's a pickled shrimp recipe in the cookbook. It's hard for me to remember what, what recipes I did put in it and didn't, but my contribution is, is usually carbs. And yes, I think you should make a double helping and, you know, sit in the car. <laughs> Eat one helping before you take in the second helping. Yeah, well, so many of us are doing Zoom book clubs these days. How are they going to know that you ate it all? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, Lynn Marie, do we have another question? Yeah, a fan of writing books on St. Simon's Island asks, and this person must have an inside track, how is the addition to Squirrel Hollow? Is it finished? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, I, uh, we built a garage with a carriage house above it, and I've kind of been documenting that on Instagram and Facebook. And by the way, please follow me on Instagram and on Facebook. You can see photos, real life photos of my real life life. Um, it's done. The, um, the um, carriage house is done. Um, it's only 500 square feet. And um, my husband and I, during quarantine, I've had date nights there twice. So we'll go over there, uh, check in, and uh, watch a movie and spend the night. That sounds wonderful. Yeah. We live a pretty boring life. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good to me. Keep the questions coming, Linda Marie. Uh, a fan of Page 158 Books in Wake Forest, North Carolina asks, how do you get started on a book? Do you outline? Do you know the characters ahead of time? Or do they tend to show up? Well, that's a great question, and there's no one answer. The answer varies from book to book. Um, with Hello Summer, my editor, uh, I had been wanting to write a book set at a newspaper, a small town newspaper for a long time. And my editor called me up last year and said, um, I have a great idea. Why don't you write a book set at a small town paper? <laughs> and so, and she, had, she wanted to have me call a Hello Summer, and I hated that title. <laughs> Uh, I fought with her about it. Uh, eventually she won. And now, of course, I have to say you were right. It's a, it's a great title. Um, with this book, I had the premise. So the premise was a uh, big city newspaper reporter goes home to a small struggling weekly and stuff happens. And so as soon as I knew that premise, I had to, I had to uh, figure out who my protagonist was, who Conley was, my um, editor always asks, has me ask myself, who is she? Because my protagonists are almost always women. Who is she? What does she want? And what's keeping her from getting it? And, you know, over the course of the, the arc of the story, I, uh, my, my character has to have a journey. And she has, that journey has to change her in some way. Something external and internal has to happen with her. Um, by the end of the story. And then I start at the beginning. I'm a really linear thinker and writer. I write a synopsis, which is basically kind of a blueprint for what I think the story will be. I'm not an outliner. I wish I were. Um, so, you know, uh, most writers divide themselves into one of two camps, pantsers or plotters. And I'm kind of a plotzer. Um, I, um, lots of times I'm writing by the seat of my pants. Um, but I have an idea of my destination. Now, I don't know how I'm going to get there, usually. For instance, I didn't know uh, what the story would be when I started that um, Conley would get her hooks into. And I didn't know that she was going to have a relationship. And I really did not know why, um, 
why she was so opposed to going home. And so once I started writing about her and thinking about her, then her, her inner story kind of began to emerge. Sometimes though, um, it's a different process. Last year's book, um, Sunset Beach, that book started because um, I wanted to write a book with sort of noir overtones. And I thought Sunset Beach was a great um, kind of noir sounding title. And there's a Sunset Beach, uh, it was the hippie beach uh, that was in the outside of St. Pete where I grew up. And I had a cousin who actually lived on Sunset Beach. And I also had an idea for the premise for that. I had a family friend who was a lawyer and his son went to work for his, his law office right out of college. And I asked him one night, I said, well, Andrew, what do you do for your dad? And he said, oh, I just go through old files, you know, blah, blah, boring, boring. And I said, wow, Andrew, what would happen if you found an old file that made you think your dad was a crook? And he just looked at me and he said, well, that would never happen. My dad's not a crook. I said, yeah, I know, but what if? So, you know, what if is always a great launch pad for a plot. Sure. Several, several people have asked, why do you use a pen name? Well, there are outstanding warrants in several states for me. <laughs> <my real name. laughs> no, actually, it's, it's really a more boring story than that. Uh, you know, I wrote 10, as Wanda told you, I wrote 10 mysteries under my real name. And then I had an idea for a different kind of story, which turned out to be Savannah Blues. And mystery readers are so brand conscious. I knew that they only wanted me to write about Callahan, who was the protagonist of eight of my mysteries. And since I, the book, story I was working on was not, Callahan wasn't in it. It was a different protagonist. Her name was Wheezy Foley. And she was um, uh, an antique dealer and she was coming out of a bad divorce. And uh, she, breaks into an old house in the middle of the night and um, a body falls out of the closet. And so I knew that I was, that was a different kind of book than I'd been writing. So I thought I'm going to use a pseudonym. Um, that's my mystery readers. There'll be resistance from my mystery readers. And the pseudonym is a combination of my children's names. My daughter, Katie is Mary Kathleen. So that's where I got Mary Kay. And my son is Andrew. And um, the other part of that, uh, equation is the fact that fiction is shelved alphabetically, as all of our booksellers here know. And when I was writing under my real name, which is Trocheck, I was down on the floor. You know, I was wedged in between Margaret Truman and Scott Turo. And I, I thought, well, you know what, if I'm going to give myself a pseudonym, I'm going to be up here high at eye level, because my readers don't want to squat to find a book. Um, Good answer. <laughs> And very true for booksellers. <laughs> right. Of all your main characters, which one has been the most exciting to write? The most exciting? Oh, gosh, that's hard. Um, well, Wheezy uh, got into a pickle over the, over the um, course of four novels. And Conley, um, you know, um, she thinks she's just going home to twiddle her thumbs and work on her tan. And she um, got into some stuff with this book. And so that was kind of fun. And last year's book, um, Sunset Beach, which just came out in paperback, actually, that one was a lot of fun. It was because I had to do a lot of research. Um, she goes to work, the character in that goes to work for her father, who is a high profile um, ambulance chasing personal injury lawyer. And she investigates an old cold case. And that cold case um, was based on a real unsolved cold case uh, in Atlanta that I had covered as a reporter. So I, I think I kind of fall in love. Um, as I'm working, I fall in love with the current book and the other books, you know, they're kind of my, they're kind of my uh, old flames. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, a fan of Ernest and Hadley books, booksellers in Tuscaloosa, Alabama asks, what are you reading now? What am I reading? I am reading a book that comes out in July. Uh, it's historic fiction by my friend, Kristen Harmel. Uh, it's called The Book of Lost Names. It takes place in uh, France during World War II. And the protagonist is a self-taught document forger. And um, it, I'll tell you, it's the first time since the whole pandemic thing started 
that I've been able to really concentrate on, on reading a book. I have a stacks of great stuff that are coming out that I can't wait to dig my teeth into. Um, but, and I've also st uh, started reading my friend Jamie Brenner's new book. It's called Summer Longing. Sorry, fly. <laughs> um, um, you know, a book that I loved this past year and that I've talked about a lot um, should be coming out in paperback any day now. And I know that, I'll, I hope a lot of you read it. It's called uh, Evie Drake Starts Over by Linda Holmes. And oh, I love that book. It's a rom-com. You know, you don't get enough good rom-coms these days. There, there's been a trend away from them. And um, I kind, I think I still kind of write rom-coms. Now I've kind of taken a thriller U-turn, but there's a lot of rom-com in there. Um, but that one was a really good one. Um, a fan of Eagle Eye Books in Decatur, Flor in Decatur Georgia asks, <laughs> asks, do you plan on writing a book to include moments surrounding this pandemic? You know, I don't intend to. But that doesn't mean I won't. You know, my books, I, I know um, after so many books that my readers come to me for a comfort read. They uh, want a big juicy peach of a book. They want to be entertained. They want to laugh. Yes, they want to cry. Um, and it might be too raw to write about this um, for next summer's book. Next summer's book is, is in the works. And I can tell you it's set in a, in a small, another small beach town at a mom and pop motel. But, you know, I've thought about, well, what would happen? Um, my friend Patty Henry and I were talking about it the other day and we said, gosh, there's so many, there's so many premises that you could use. For instance, you know, what happens to somebody who's having an affair, right. <laughs> you know? How do they break quarantine? Do they break quarantine? Or do they have to go on lockdown with somebody that they find out maybe after prolonged exposure they don't really like? <laughs> um, another viewer asks, what is that little house behind you? Oh, it's a 1950s uh, metal uh, tin litho dollhouse. You know, I'm a, I'm a, um, I'm not even in recovery. I'm a junker. And I think I had a dollhouse like that when I was growing up and I saw it in an estate sale. It's got a few pieces of furniture in it. And you know, this house, our house ebb tied on, on uh, Tybee, uh, we have it in a, in a vacation rental program. So it, it gets rented out to lots of fans and people. And I always hope, well, maybe some little girl will be a rainy day and she'll sit in here and play with the dollhouse. Or a little boy, who knows? A number of people have asked if you'll be writing more installments for the Wheezy Savannah characters. Uh, you know, next summer's book is not, does not have Wheezy and Bebe in it, but I never say never. Um, if they tell me their story, then um, I'll, I'll try to listen. I didn't intend to write four installments. After I wrote Savannah Blues, I thought this is it. I don't know anything more about these women. And then um, I was having dinner at a nice restaurant in Charleston one night on book tour and I was eavesdropping on a conversation at the table behind mine and I heard a woman tell she was very well dressed older lady um obviously um money and uh she was telling her younger dinner companions about the struggle she had had in her divorce because her ex-husband was hiding assets from her and how all the things she'd had to do to uh, uncover all the assets he was hiding. And that gave me the idea to write um, Savannah, Bru Savannah Ble Breeze, sorry, little, little, little. Savannah Breeze, which was the second in the um, Savannah series. Um, could you tell us, you've talked, talked about this a little bit, but could you tell us about your writing routine? Well, first I drink a quart of vodka. <laughs> no, I don't drink <laughs> Maybe a nip. <laughs> Sacramental vodka. Right. Um, I, well, you know, usually what happens, I, I mentioned to you that I, I, I go to New York uh, several times a year. And after I turn in a book, I go and I meet with my editor, Jennifer Enderlin at St. Martin's Press, my longtime editor. 
and Stuart Krzyzewski is my longtime agent. We go have lunch and we drink a lot of expensive wine on the company uh, dime. Yay. Yeah, we <laughs> brainstorm ideas. Uh, lots of times uh, Jen has an idea or I have an idea and we kick it around and um, we talk about titles. Titles are really important to me. I want a great grabber of a title. Um, I want a title that you will not forget, uh, like Hello Summer. Um, I write a synopsis. I might bounce that synopsis back and forth with my agent and I. We collaborate pretty closely. Um, uh, and uh, he'll suggest something and I'll redo something. And um, my editor gives the okay. And then I sit down and I start. And I, as I said, I write in a linear fashion. Um, I know where I hope to go. I know where the book is set. I know the protagonist. I know her name. Um, when I'm writing, having a good day, I can write as many as, a good day is writing as 2,000 words. Um, and uh, if I can get uh, started writing uh, in the morning, that's always a plus. Um, I write longhand. I usually start writing longhand in a composition book. And I'm trying to see if I've got one around here somewhere. I do, but it's not within arm's reach. You know, the old black and white speckled composition books you used in school. Um, I used to write in yellow legal pads and then I kept losing them. And I, I found that the uh, composition books are um, easier to keep my notes in. So I start making notes. I might ask myself questions and that segues into writing when it's going good. It's like priming the pump. Once the pump is primed, then I'll jump on my computer and I'll start typing into the computer. I'll revise as I go. 2000 words is a great day for me. Um, I don't write every day. Um, so many days are given over to the business of writing. Um, I do a lot with social media. I want to stay connected to my readers in a, in a genuine way. Um, if you see something posted 99% uh, of the time, unless it's something technical that I don't know how to do, it's me. There's no staff of people posting things. It's, it's me. Um, the closer I get to deadline, um, to blowing the deadline, which I always do, I, I run away from home to write. So maybe I run down here to the beach or I borrow a friend's cabin in the mountains and I lock myself up. There's no television allowed. Uh, there are strict rules and I make them all up as I go. <laughs> I eat the same food every night. It's a ritual. I'm Catholic. I need my rituals. Mm -hmm. I burn a, um, a uh, red currant candle, aromatherapy candle. Um, I make a pot of spaghetti on the first day of my writer's retreat. And that's what I have every night and salad because I'm, you know, I'm not a savage. <laughs> um, there's peanut, there's peanut M&Ms involved. I'll, I'll say that. Mm -hmm. I'll just say that there are peanut M&Ms as a motivating factor. Um, and uh, if I write, for instance, if I write a thousand words, well, then I can have some M&Ms and, and if it's past 11 AM, I could have a glass of wine. <laughs> And I, I write um, lots of times when I'm all by myself, I'll wake up at four in the morning. You know, the, my book, I have to have my head in the world of the book to really have no interruptions. I have to live in the world of that book. And so going away helps, even though I'm, we're empty nesters. There are, I mean, I have grandchildren around. I mean, they're right around here today now. Um, but I need to be in the world of the book. And so if I, if I wake up at four in the morning, I can switch on the lights. I, I put my laptop in bed with me so that if I do wake up, I roll over, grab the laptop and start, or my notebook and start writing. And I just go from there. I don't do multiple drafts. Um, I'm really writing by the seat of my pants. I hand it in. Uh, my editor and agent are reading over my shoulder as I go, which is unusual, I find. I don't know too many other writers that do it that way. But I need them to tell me if I'm, if I'm going off on some crazy tangent, then they can steer me back onto the righteous road. Sounds like a great team. Linda Marie, we have time for one more question. Okay. When did you know you wanted to be a writer? I can't remember not wanting to be a writer. Uh, I was reading before first grade. 
Um, my parents were great readers. They read, they had a subscription to the daily newspaper and they sat at the breakfast table every morning and read the paper. And then I would take it and pretend to read it or read it. And as soon as I got to first grade, I, I was writing stories and um, reading chapter books. I could already read, so the, I had an amazing first grade teacher. And if any of you on listening tonight are teachers, bless your hearts. Thank you, because teacher, uh, wonderful teachers and parents who let me do what I wanted to do are the reason that, that I'm a writer today, because I was an early reader and um, they let me read whatever I wanted. So I've been really, I've been so blessed um, in that regard to have great teachers and uh, a family that, that valued uh, reading. Although, you know, my father thought it was, it was crazy that anybody would ever pay me to write. <laughs> thank you, Mary Kay, so much. And thank you, everyone. This was wonderful. Oh, it was entirely my pleasure. Thank you all so much. Now go to your Indie Bookstore's websites. Yay! Yay! Yes, if you enjoyed this as much as I did, let your bookstore know and order the book from them. Yes. We will be scheduling scores of authors, and I can also let you know that the author that Mary Kay mentioned, Kristen, is going to be here in July when her book comes out. Oh, um, yeah, great gonna time. going to have her on this program. You'll have a great time. Also, let, let your bookstore know if there's any ideas or suggestions you have for how this could be better for you and order Hello Summer from them. Thanks again, Mary Kay. Thank you, Linda Marie and Nikki. And this is Wanda signing off.